Good evening. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here tonight for the Frank Guarini Government Lecture. Um, this is an event that we really look forward to every year. It was established in honor of our most esteemed graduate, Frank Guarini, a former state senator in New Jersey, seven-time U.S. congressman, uh, a distinguished leader of this school, um, and someone we count on for vision and support and have done for many years. And he's a longtime supporter of this lecture series, which reflects his own dedication to public service um, and his admonition that this law school continue to value uh, public service, and indeed we do. And so each year we invite a leader within the public ser service world to come and speak to our students and alumni and other members of this community. And this year we are delighted to welcome Judge John Gleason of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York. Judge Gleason, as many of you know, will be stepping down on March 9th uh, after 21 years on the federal bench. And he's had a truly illustrious career in public service uh, before being uh, nominated by President Clinton uh, to the bench. Uh, he made a name for himself as a federal prosecutor in the Eastern District of New York. He was best known for securing the conviction of mafia boss John Gotti. Um, he was serving as the chief of the office's criminal division when he was appointed to the bench in 1994. Since 1995, Judge Gleason has also been an adjunct professor of law here at NYU. And this semester, he's teaching a sentencing seminar that examines the theories and purposes of sentencing and how it has come to be known in the era of mass incarceration in the United States. Judge Gleason has garnered uh, many headlines. Uh, judges don't seek them out, um, but uh, he has made many important decisions in his time on the bench and has really earned the deep respect of his colleagues, of the lawyers who practice in front of him, and of all others who, um, who attend to the work of the federal judiciary. He's also been a very prominent advocate for alternatives to, our, to incarceration. Um, he has helped create two programs in uh, the Brooklyn federal courts aimed at reducing or eliminating prison time for nonviolent drug offenders and young defendants. Uh, these were among the first of their kind in the federal court system. Uh, and this really innovative approach uh, is all the more timely coming now when the Obama administration is calling for an overhaul or at least a rethinking of federal sentencing laws and when the Justice Department has supported additional changes to the federal sentencing guidelines. Uh, in this and in many other ways, Judge Gleason is not simply an expert, he is a pioneer. Uh, we are grateful to have him with us this evening, grateful to count him as a member of this community. Um, we, uh, it's bittersweet to think of the end of his time on the federal bench as approaching, but on the other hand, we look forward with great anticipation to what he will do next, and we're glad that he's with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Judge Gleason. Well, thank you so much, Dean Morrison, for that great overly kind introduction. Thank you all for coming on such a forbidding evening in New York. I'm grateful you're here. Um, it's really an honor to deliver this lecture in and of itself, but it's especially an honor to deliver it, to deliver it in the presence of Congressman Guarini. Thank you so much for your commitment to public service, for your sponsorship of this lecture, and for your being here. It really is a privilege to be here. I want to talk to you this evening about a couple of programs in our court in the Eastern District of New York that are our answer to one of the most important problems in criminal justice today, and that is over-incarceration. I could glaze your eyes over with, with data. I, I won't. I'll spare you um, all of that except the essentials, which are the federal prison population, has more than tripled since the current guidelines era, we call it, began in the late 1980s. The one thing that all three of the institutions at the heart of our federal sentencing policy agree on, and I'm talking about Congress and the Sentencing Commission and the Department of Justice, those are the three main players, is the need to do something about our dangerously overcrowded federal prisons. 
that consensus exists really along all ideological lines. And there are quite a few other answers to the over-incarceration problem. Some of them address the fact that the people who do need to be incarcerated get prison terms that are way too long. But our programs, what I want to focus on tonight, um, are really at the other end. That is, they are efforts to responsibly identify the people who we've, we have routinely been sending off to prison in the past couple of decades who don't need to be imprisoned at all. One of our programs is a drug court. We call it the Pretrial Opportunity Program, or POP. That's how I'll refer to it tonight. The other is a youthful offender court, which we call the Special Options Services, or SOS, and I'll refer it by that acronym, by, that, by those initials as well. And I want to use my time tonight, and I told Dean Morrison at the outset, you know, if I forget to look at the time and stop when he asked me to stop, I'm just going to... I'm just going to keep going, so, so bear that in mind and feel free when the time, when the witching hour comes to give me the signal, because this is important stuff. I want to use my time tonight to tell you how these programs began, what they are, how they have fared, how they have helped to spawn a national movement. I'll get to this chart, I hope, before my time is up, and what needs to be done now on this topic of alternatives to incarceration. Let me turn first to the POP program, the drug court. In, the, in August of 2011, I went to the Ninth Circuit Judicial Conference out in Southern California. I was asked to spend an entire week out there, but I was specifically invited to attend a day-long meeting at the conclusion of the Conference of the Judges that Judge Harry Pragerson organized, to which he basically ordered all of the U.S. attorneys and federal defenders in the Ninth Circuit to attend. I wasn't at all sure why I was invited. I had spent 10 years as a federal prosecutor, hanging around with prosecutors, and then when I went on the bench, I spent 10 years on the Defender Services Program, the Judicial Conference Committee that runs the Federal Defender Program, and I figured I must have been invited to do what Judge Pragerson had in mind for that meeting, which is to help prosecutors and defenders play well together in the courts of the Ninth Circuit. At the time, I had a former law clerk who was the U.S. attorney in Oregon who confided in me that the prosecutors and the defenders at that meeting were not interested in being in that meeting at all, let alone in playing well together in the course of the Ninth Circuit. But they didn't feel that it was appropriate to say no to Judge Pragerson. Anyway, at one of these sessions, there was a, at one of the, one of the segments of this day-long meeting was a session about uh, re-entry, federal re-entry drug courts. It was a lively session at which a judge, a chief judge in Oregon, Ann Aiken, spoke about re-entry drug courts. And the terminology here is important. A re-entry drug court helps addicted defendants after they have served their prison terms. Chief Judge Aiken spoke very persuasively about the benefits of judicial involvement in the supervision process how effective it was in helping people control their addictions, how rewarding it was for the judges involved, how much money it saved the government to shave one year off a typical three-year supervision term. Now, since I'd been invited to fly across the country on the Ninth Circuit's dime and spend an entire week at this beautiful resort in Southern California, I thought it wouldn't look good if I didn't do or say anything while I was there. So I figured I'd better ask a question. And uh, I asked a question that actually had occurred to me frequently over the years. My district, the Eastern District of New York, is the cradle of re-entry drug courts in the federal system. Our late colleague, Tony Sifton, started what we believe is the first one back in 2002. And for quite a, two, for quite a few years, we've had two of them presided over by two of my colleagues. I had been to both and admired how they work and the benefits they produce for the addicted post-sentence defendants in them. But for a couple of years, I found myself asking myself why we were waiting for prison terms to be over before putting addicted defendants in drug courts. If judicial involvement 
in the supervision programs actually helps people control their addictions and reduces recidivism. Mm -hmm. Why not do that the moment a case begins rather than wait a few years while the case is processed and the defendant serves a prison term? My thinking was as follows. If the reward of reducing a three-year term of post-sentence supervision to only two years was such a powerful behavior modif modification tool. Just think how motivated the defendants would be if the reward would be to avoid prison entirely. In other words, my question was, why don't we have no entry drug courts? Now, this wasn't exactly novel thinking on my part. I'd been teaching, as Dean Morrison mentioned, I've been teaching here for 20 years. I taught in other places for almost a decade before that. And I'd been teaching my students about successful drug court programs in the state courts for years before I went out to the Ninth Circuit Conference. Anyway, I introduced myself to the meeting. No one except my former law clerk knew who I was. And I said, why don't we just take this model that works so well in Oregon and move it up to the pre-sentence phase? And I shared with the group the thoughts that I just expressed to you. And I have to say, everybody was pretty quiet after I spoke. The only response I got was from Sean Kennedy, who was then the, the federal defender in Los Angeles, who told me that his office was beginning talks with Andre Barat, then the United States Attorney in LA, with an eye towards creating just such a program. And that turned out to be, to be the beginning of a long relationship with the Central District of California on this topic. I came back to Brooklyn with two goals in mind. The more important one was to figure out how I could get myself invited to the next Ninth Circuit Judicial <laughs> Conference, which was going to be in Hawaii. <laughs> and the second was to create a pre-sentence drug court in the federal system. I called Roberto Cordero, our chief pretrial services officer, who at the time I barely knew, and asked him if he would help me create what would become known as the POP program, the Pretrial Opportunity Program. We had a nice conversation. He told me he'd work on it. And I didn't hear from him for really a couple of months, which I thought was his gentle way of telling me that I was crazy. But then he showed up one day in my office with a pretrial services officer, Laura Thami, and a written proposal, which we worked on together. And we were basically making it up as we went along, which made it kind of fun. By January of 2012, so four years ago, I had enlisted my friend and colleague, who's right here, Chief Magistrate Judge Stephen Gold. And we told our brother and sister judges at a meeting, at a Board of Judges meeting in the Eastern District, about the newly created POP program. We gave them the history of the program, where the idea, the successful course of conduct in the states with respect to drug courts, we apprised them of what they already knew, which is this over-incarceration problem in the federal prisons, and specifically the bloating of the federal prisons with nonviolent uh, drug trafficking offenders who themselves were substance abusers. And we apprised them of what we planned to do. And truth be told, at the time we uh, told them about this program, we were just planning to do it with the cases in my docket but we finished our presentation by telling the court it would be much better if it were a project of the Eastern District of New York, not just of Judges Gleason and Gold. To the lasting credit of my colleagues and my court, they agreed and the POP program became the, a program adopted by the Eastern District Board of Judges. Now, a core belief underlying POP and any drug court is that many substance abusers are arrested for behavior that arises out of their addictions. And but for those addictions, they wouldn't have found themselves enmeshed in the criminal justice system. And the POP program provides a framework for intensive supervision of these defendants, combining judicial involvement as the defining characteristic of a drug court is it's the regular judicial involvement in the rehabilitative efforts of the participants in the court. In addition to their more frequent meetings with the pretrial services officer and the drug treatment providers, the participants meet monthly 
with the judges around the table in a courtroom. In our Brooklyn courthouse, they meet with me, with Judge Gold, pretrial services officer Laura Fami, and one another. These group meetings address each participant's progress in the preceding month, the problems they faced, the goals for the upcoming month, the participants support and strengthen each other in these meetings, and the hands-on involved, and hands-on involvement of the judges is an important source of support and motivation. The social science in the states makes it crystal clear that the interaction with a person in authority, a judge, uh, in, a, in that role where the judge is playing a supportive role has everything to do with the uh, enhancement in drug treatment retention rates, reductions in recidivism, but I think I speak for Judge Gold as well as myself when I say that the, a much more important feature is how they interact with one another, the support the participants in a drug court provide to one another in those monthly meetings. Most of the participants have already entered pleas of guilty by the time they enter the program, but not all of them, and a guilty plea is not a prerequisite to participation. They do agree to adjourn further proceedings in their case, that is, the sentencing if they pled guilty, if not, the trial, for at least a year while they participate in the program. The, our program, unlike the program that, uh, that cropped up a couple of months behind us out in LA, the CASA program, doesn't have the formal uh, interagency agreement with the U.S. Attorney's Office, but rather Judge Gold and I went to Loretta Lynch, who was then our U.S. Attorney, now our Attorney General, at the outset of our program, and we asked for her support on the sidelines. We knew we could adjourn the sentence. We required the defendants to agree to it, and we asked Loretta Lynch for her uh, support. And as I'll get to in a few moments, in a few minutes, we got support from her that was beyond, really beyond our wildest imagination. I'll get to that in a few minutes. To complete the POP program successfully, participants have to remain drug free uh, for a continuous 12 month period, but there's more than that. They participate in the monthly meetings, they have to follow all the rules, especially rules of their inpatient drug treatment uh, programs, and most of them spend a fair amount of time, sometimes lengthy amounts of time in inpatient drug treatment. They're expected to seek and obtain high school equivalency uh, degrees. They're expected to seek and obtain employment if they can. We provide them social services. There's a wide array of social services available here in New York to support them. We make them available to them. We give them the opportunity, hence the name of the program, we give them the opportunity to make something of their terrible situation. They're all arrested for very serious drug trafficking crimes. Uh, not all the SOS participants are drug trafficking defendants, but most of them are. The participants in our POP program, all their cases are reassigned to me and to Judge Gold. Um, the social science shows that the uh, drug courts work best when the participants meet monthly with the same judges who will ultimately decide their cases. Judge Gold presides over any proceedings that follow violations. He imposes sanctions that vary widely, ranging from uh, a different modality of drug treatment to uh, more stringent uh, conditions, other conditions of pretrial supervision, uh, setting back the projected date of their graduation up to periods of custody. Today, this afternoon, a few hours ago, Judge Gold had to remand to custody one of the participants in our POP program. Now, let me turn to the Special Options Services Program, our Youthful Offender Court. Our district has always had its fair share of young defendants who were charged with nonviolent crimes, usually, as I mentioned, but not always, drug trafficking offenses. And their involvement in the criminal justice system appears to be the result, not of addiction so much as a lack of any adult supervision in their lives. These are young men and women who were raised in circumstances in which no one ever taught them the importance of getting out of bed in the morning and going to school or going to work or looking for work. More than 15 years ago, at the suggestion of the great Jack Weinstein, our colleague, we established a special option services program, the SOS program, 
And the concept was pretty simple. This was a population that was too frequently in pretrial detention, pending the adjudication of their cases. Judge Weinstein and pretrial services believe that they and, they and the public as well would be better off if they were instead subject to intense supervision and given access to education and job training and counseling. SOS targets, targets juvenile and young adult offenders, defendants, who are between the ages of 18 and 25. Again, there's a wide variety of community, educational, vocational, and volunteer resources made available to us. We've gone out and pretrial services and the court has gone out to enlist them. And the SOS participants are expected to obtain their high school equivalency certificates. Some go to college. They're given the opportunity and the requirement of enrolling in uh, vocational programs, other training programs to obtain mental health treatment and the counseling they need. They need the structure that wasn't available to them before they got involved in our system. For many years, SOS operated solely under the auspices of pretrial services. It had no direct judicial involvement. In recent years, Officer Amina Adasa Ali has supervised all of the participants in the SOS program, up to 30 at a time. She's provided periodic status reports to the assigned district judges and attended their sentencings. And what happened was after we began the pop court and began an intensive supervision program that was judge involved, we went to Amina and asked her if she thought it would help her and the young defendants under her supervision to make SOS a judge involved program as well. That is if we restructured it so that she could bring the young people, her young charges monthly to a meeting with judges. She said yes and the SOS program was modified in 2013 to include the participation of two judicial officers, District Judge Joan Azrak, who's here tonight, thank you for coming, Joni, and Magistrate Judge Cheryl Pollack. They hold monthly meetings with Amina Adasa Ali, the pretrial services officer, and the SOS participants, and they're similar in nature. Their progress and problems in the past month are addressed, their goals for the, for the future month or months are addressed, the judicial involvement is designed to enhance the support system and to provide the encouragement, not just to comply with the conditions of the program, but to affect real changes in their lives. Now, those are the two programs in broad strokes. What does a participant get in return for successful completion? As I mentioned to you, in the re-entry setting, from which we learned a great deal, the quid pro quo is crystal clear. Successful participation means you get one year off your typical three-year term of post-prison post supervision. In, with respect to the POP and SOS programs, these, these uh, pre-sentence, hopefully no entry courts, it's much less clear in our model. When a participant's rehabilitative program is nearing a successful conclusion, and the sentencing date approaches, we, by operation of federal rule of criminal procedure, we judges fall out of it. We're prohibited from engaging in plea discussions under federal rule 11. So what happens is the counsel or the lawyers for the successful POP or SOS participants go to the prosecutor and negotiate with the prosecutor and there's no reason for you to fully understand the gamut of possibilities one would be to ask a prosecutor not to object to, I mean, these are alternative to incarceration programs. So the idea at, the, at their inception was to uh, put people in a position to avoid a prison term. These prison terms are generally three, four, five years under the federal sentencing guidelines. So one option for the defense lawyer to talk to the prosecutor about is not opposing a sentence that does not include incarceration, a probation sentence. That's the whole idea at the outset. As you'll learn in a few minutes, there have turned out to be other options as well. But I want to introduce you to a few of our participants. I do this with some trepidation because, you know, I'm not a real member of the academy. I'm a trench dweller, right? I'm over there in Brooklyn. Trenches don't get any deeper than in the trial court in Brooklyn. Um, 
But I, I've been hanging around the academy enough to know that, you know, you don't advocate policy change based on anecdotes. And I'm not suggesting to you for a moment that um, when I introduce you to these folks that, you know, you should bring a tear to your eye and you should go out and become like I am, an advocate for alternatives to incarceration. But, so that's a disclaimer at the outset. I will say this, there's nothing like individual cases to inspire you. And there's nothing like these people's cases to inspire you. And after all, you know, in the end of the day, um, data collection is important. Data analysis is important. It's critical. But in the end of the day, this is what we're talking about, right? There are, we, we live in courtrooms, and at the other end of our sentences are people. They're real people. This is Emily. Emily lived in Brooklyn, has lived in Brooklyn her whole life. Her parents separated when she was four years old because of her father's addiction to crack. She began smoking marijuana at age 11, daily. When she was 22, she found her mom dead of cirrhosis and her addiction ratcheted up a few notches. She snorted cocaine every single day, stealing from her fiance to support her habit. In 2007 and again in 2008, Emily underwent drug treatment, but to no avail. Her fiance uh, prodded her into drug treatment, but both times it was unsuccessful. In 2011, Emily brought her three children to Guyana in an effort to reconcile them with her father, who was still addicted to, to crack at the time. While there, her youngest child fell ill, requiring them to change their return tickets at significant cost to Emily, and she didn't have the money. A man who was nearby heard of her, uh, of her quandary and offered to pay the price of changing the return flights in exchange for Emily bringing a suitcase into the United States and for some cash as well. Emily's no dope. She knew that there was something illegal in that suitcase, and she was right. There were 13 kilos of cocaine in it. She was arrested at John F. Kennedy Airport. She was released that day by Judge Gold on the condition she returned two days later with people who would sign her bond. And when she returned two days later, she was high, and Chief Magistrate Judge Gold remanded her. And to this day, Emily will tell anybody who will listen that the mo one of the most significant moments of her life was when Steve Gold remanded her. She stayed in custody for weeks, right? Became one of the charter members of our POP program. She spent a year in inpatient drug treatment. She got a GED. She got a commercial driver's license. For about a year, once she got out of uh, drug treatment, she did inpatient treatment and then outpatient treatment. She commuted by subway two hours each day, subway and train, to an hourly bus driving job out in Nassau County. Emily started a new job today. She's now a bus driver for the MTA. Once she finishes her probationary period, she will have paid vacation time and sick leave and job security. That's what she cares about most. Most important, Emily, who was, as I mentioned, was in and out of unsuccessful drug treatment twice before she came to our drug court, has now been clean for 53 months. This is Rose Marie right here. I can tell already I'm not going to get through these stories. Besides, I'm going to have you crying if I get to the end of all of them. Um, Rose Marie was 28 at the time of her arrest. She'd been in a relationship for four years with one of her co-defendants. She uh, was arrested in an apartment with hundreds of prescriptions for oxycodone. She had no employment history. She was supported by that co-defendant of hers and the money that was made from their illegal distribution of oxycodone. Rose Marie had years of uh, prescription drug and heroin abuse cocaine abuse, ecstasy abuse. She had been addicted since age 15 and was taking at least four oxycodone pills a day. She tried co to commit suicide at 15. She was detained for about eight weeks and released directly into a long-term residential drug treatment program. She entered our program in July of 2012. 
Her adjustment, this is typical, was rocky at first. She kept breaking the rules. She kept uh, resisting the discipline that came with being in a drug treatment program. She was remanded into custody in February of 2013. As is typical for most of the participants in our POP program, there came a point where uh, Rosemarie just had a complete attitude change. Didn't happen overnight, but it was palpable when it did happen. The treatment professionals described her as actively engaged in her treatment program. She became a peer leader. Her change in attitude was conspicuous around the table in our monthly participant meetings. She became proud of her accomplishments. She's now the mother of two healthy children. She's in a stable relationship with their father who's employed and supports the family. Most importantly, she's clean now for 34 months. When her children get a little older, she's planning to attend college. Uh, Sinem is right here. And Sinem was arrested when she was 33 years old and 34 weeks pregnant with a crack addicted baby in her belly and a seven year old daughter at the time. She was using five bags of heroin and, ten, and ingesting 10 oxycodone pills daily at the time she was arrested. She'd been addicted for seven years. She was released after her initial arrest to a residential drug treatment program and she broke the rules. She had the baby she was carrying, a girl, lost custody of her immediately. She had already lost the custody of her seven-year-old. She uh, used drugs in the drug treatment program. And let me tell you something about our system and how it normally treats someone like Sinem. I don't know if they still teach Robinson versus California. I, I read it when I was a law student. It's, it's not a crime to be an addict. And, you know, a, a common refrain in the drug treatment world is relapse is a part of recovery. But notwithstanding those two realities, um, if you're an addict and you provide a dirty urine and you're already in the federal criminal justice system, God help you. You know, in most places, off to prison you go. And that would have been Sinem's fate in most places in this country. But her pretrial services officer was willing to try something different. She arranged for a transfer to a different residential drug treatment program. Sinem's attitude improved. After a while, her newborn was permitted to spend time with her in that program. She joined our POP program. The, uh, I can tell already, I'm gonna have to truncate these remarks. Sinem is now employed, raising her two children uh, with her, uh, her boyfriend, and they live out in Nassau County. She has completely turned her life around. She's now clean for 26 months. This is Jerry, fond in our circles of the aphorism, of, of saying, of repeating the aphorism, no one wants a grandmother, no one wants a junkie for a grandmother. This is Lorraine, our SOS assistant, I'll get to her in a minute. And this is Geraldine. I assure you, they have equally compelling stories. Here's why I pick these six. Uh, as I mentioned to you, when the uh, successful participation in these programs comes to a conclusion, prosecutors are approached by defense counsel for people like these six. And at the outset of this program, what we had in mind was a program that was an alternative to incarceration, right? A no entry. You don't go to prison. And our attorney general, who was then the United States attorney, essentially raised the ante, you know, saw us and raised us because Emily was the first to appear. Remember, she was convicted of smuggling. She pled guilty to smuggling 13 kilograms of cocaine. And I put her case on for sentencing in my courtroom after she successfully completed the program. And on the day for sentencing, the assistant U.S. attorney came in and said, she has turned her life around to such an extent that the U.S. attorney is gonna dismiss the charges against her. And the same happened for all six of these participants. So our POP program and our SOS program uh, at Lorraine 
have not just become alternatives to incarceration, but with respect to these folks and, and with respect to 37% of our total successful participants, they've become diversion programs. The, we could have, uh, Congressman Guarini could have a lecture next year and have it usefully devoted to the collateral consequences of convictions. There's no overstating what it does to someone, how disabling it is for someone to go through life with a federal felony conviction, even if they haven't gone to prison. All six of these participants are not only not going to prison, they don't have convictions, and that's because of the leadership provided by the Department of Justice and by Loretta Lynch specifically. Um, where do we go from here? Let me tell you about a little uh, anomaly in our federal criminal justice system. The, uh, we have a sentencing regime, a principal component of which is the Federal Sentencing Guidelines Manual. There's a sentencing commission that creates a manual that is the starting point for every federal sentence. And if all you had to go by was that guidelines manual, you would believe it was not even lawful not to sentence these folks to prison. You look at that manual, and the manual doesn't even authorize a probation sentence, doesn't authorize an alternative to incarceration, let alone what the executive branch, what the U.S. attorney decided to do, which is dismiss the charges. So one obvious important fundamental uh, thing to be done is for the Sentencing Commission to let judges know that this is okay. And let's face it, if prosecutors are telling judges to dismiss the charges, at the very least, you would think it's okay for judges not to send people to prison. So to do, the number one thing on our to-do list is to get the commission to acknowledge the fact that judge-involved intensive supervision programs like POP and SOS are working. The social science in the, in the states has established emphatically that they reduce recidivism rates, that they enhance the efficacy of drug treatment. So we need the Sentencing Commission to put its imprimatur on that. What, this, what the commission says is advisory, thanks to a Supreme Court decision that's now 10 years old, but it doesn't mean it's not important, and it's important that it send the proper message. The other thing, and I suggested this before I began to introduce you to our successful participants, is, is data collection, right? We know that just, we know these things feel right. Actually, we know they are right. The judges who are involved in these programs know they are exactly the right thing to do for so many reasons. One, they, they put a human face on a, on a sentencing regime that has been so desperately in need of a human face for three decades now. That's a good thing. Second, there's more than one way to protect the community. You know, one is to take the people who know, who need to go to prison out of the community and imprison them. Sentence length is another issue for another day. But another way to protect the community is to make sure the people who have routinely been sentenced to prison terms but don't need to be are not and are treated instead. It costs, the, it costs less than 3000 a year to provide the kind of supervision that we provided to these folks. It would have cost the federal government $30,000 per year per inmate if we had sentenced them to the, on average, four-year prison term that the guidelines appear to require us to impose upon them. Um, we know it's right, but, you know, knowing it's one thing, proving it's another, so we've asked for, we've asked for help. We asked for help from, the, from professionals, from the types of organizations, the Vera Institute, for example, that know what data to collect, help us gather the data, help us evaluate it, prove in the federal system, as has already been proven in the states, the long-term efficacy of these programs. The, uh, the other thing that needs to be done is already well underway, and that's what this chart's all about. I am so proud of this, and it's, it's so much the doing of our pretrial services department and Roberto Cordero, who I mentioned earlier. Hardly a, a session goes by, I may be overstating it, but only slightly. 
Hardly a pop session goes by, or an SOS session it seems, where we don't have delegations of judges and pretrial services officers from other districts around the country coming to watch what we do. There's a real thirst for this out there and in canvassing all of these, uh, in, in entertaining the, the visit requests and in canvassing them and preparing um, reports about this. If you, by the way, if you Google alternatives to incarceration in the Eastern District of New York, you'll see a long report to our Board of Judges from just this past August that includes um, more data than I've given you and a, and a more fulsome description of our programs. And in canvassing the judges around the country to prepare that report, what we found was, it was interesting. In some of the places where, where drug courts are now prop, cropping up, pre-sentence, no entry drug courts, what's happened is state judges get appointed to the federal bench. They come onto the bench, they have before them low level, nonviolent folks, not you know charged with federal felonies, but they're not the most serious crimes in the courthouse. They're addicted and they look around and say, well, where's the drug court? We had a drug court in state court. So you know what they've done? They've created their own. And they, they are from a grassroots level helping to import this phenomenon into the federal system. And you can see, I'll tell you how many are here, there are now um, up and running or on the drawing board um, programs like ours, drug courts, youthful offender courts in 22 federal districts. And you know, there's some places around the country that look at that guidelines manual and they, the judges there, God bless them, they respect the sentencing commission uh, greatly. And if it's not authorized by the guidelines manual, they're just not gonna do it. Hence the need to amend that guidelines manual. But even against that, uh, against that opposition, you can see this growing movement in the federal courts towards alternatives to incarceration. And we owe it to ourselves. I mean, this stuff has worked emphatically, and indisputably in the state systems. And I don't know how we can all agree that we have a mass incarceration problem that needs to be addressed and not make every effort to address it in all its facets. I'm just focusing on one, that is identifying some segments of our population that we can maybe uh, avoid sending to prison and doing it responsibly. And, you know, with any luck, you'll come back in a couple of years and someone will show you a chart like this and there'll be all 94 federal districts on it. There probably ought to be. How'd I do, Dean Morrison? Seven o'clock, right on the nose. Thank you for listening. Sure, there, there's plenty of variation. There's a tension, you know. On the one hand, a number of different laboratories, I think would be a good thing. Um, on the other, as I mentioned, we are kind of concerned about gathering data. And one, one problem the, uh, is the sample sizes are small. So it's difficult to gather meaningful data district by district. We have, I should have mentioned this earlier, thanks for the opportunity. We have a total of, uh, 79 participants in POP and SOS, of which 39 have now successfully completed their course through the programs, 37. That's really not enough for uh, there to be you know, data that would support a study you could rely upon. Um, so we wanna scale it up. On the other hand, as it's being scaled up, 
there's a lot of variations on the theme. Um, some folks have different models in which the intake is, there's a formal role for the U.S. Attorney on the intake, whereas our pretrial services officer is the sole gatekeeper. There are some, there, at the, on the fringes, there are some true oddities. For example, Central District of Illinois, to become a participant in the, in the drug court, you have to cooperate with the government. It's not exactly the model I have in mind. Um, so, um, and so much is a creature of local uh, custom, you know. There are places in the United States where before these courts came along, people could, could avoid going to prison in only one way, and that is to cooperate with the government. And in several districts, what's happened are judges who are enthusiastic about this idea have created a court, um, gotten right to the brink of starting it, and then the assistant U.S. attorneys, like a light bulb goes off, they're like, wait a second. Now they're gonna have a chance to avoid going to prison by not cooperating with me. So that's produced a good deal of tension. So there are growing pains, there are variations. Um, I, I think on balance now, since we're in the early stages, the laboratory model probably even serves us best. And one, one thing we could do in terms of getting help from places like Vera and Center for Court Innovation is just to have a study to determine what the best practices are. So we could at least, as people develop different models around the country, have a feel for what the best practices are in terms of discipline and the like. If you don't ask questions, I'm gonna call on you. Hi, Paul. Hi, I got Judge. my former students and interns here, they're plants. Um, <laughs> In terms of the key players in this area, you talked about what the Justice Department has done to support drug courts, at least what the Attorney General did when she was the U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District, and you mentioned what the Sentencing Commission could do. So my question is, um, especially given the at least nominal support for criminal justice reform, um, or bipartisan support, what could Congress do to support the mission of drug courts, or do the district courts already have the resources they need to do this themselves? No, great question, and I should have mentioned it earlier, thank you. Um, Congress can do a lot of things. W one is, tone matters so much, and even if they don't fund it, if Congress can put its imprimatur on, even just ask for a report from the commission on drug courts, for example, to focus attention on it. More importantly, um, this arguably falls in the don't get me started because if I start talking about mandatory minimums, we're never get, gonna get out of here. But more importantly, Congress could uh, provide funding. You know, it, not so much in New York. It doesn't really cost us that much. A popular misconception is this is a resource drain to do what we're doing. Most of these people in New York are getting the form of supervision that they would get even if they weren't in our pop court. But there are places in the country where there's not an inpatient drug treatment facility within an hour of the courthouse. There are places in the country where it'd be a more significant drain just by the way they do their supervision on the pretrial services officers. So, you know, I'm, as I mentioned to you, there's enormous cost savings to the Bureau of Prisons through our program, right? They, they save $30,000 per inmate per year. But you know what? When they save that money, they don't, they don't write a check. <laughs> they don't write a check to the judiciary. So what it, it doesn't help probation when they say, whoa, well, this is fine, we're saving money, but it's not our money. So funds need to be allocated properly to incentivize courts to have these programs, to allow them to have a reduced caseload for pretrial services officers so we can spend $2,000, 2,500 a year instead of the 30,000 a year that gets spent when the alternative road is taken. Max. Yeah, raise your hand if you're not a student or a former intern. I'm just kidding. Um, that actually goes right into my question, which is basically that, um, so in your sentencing class, we talk a lot about uh, BOP, especially on our field trip, we talk about BOP and how sometimes there's friction with certain criminal justice and sentencing reform 
issues, especially that are coming out of the judiciary or coming out of pretrial services, do you think that, I mean, it's kind of more of a radical reform, but like, do you think that integrating BOP less in the Department of Justice and more in the judiciary would be a more seamless kind of integration of those services so that there was less of a, they don't cut a check issue among other issues? Wow, that's pretty radical, Max. It's a great, I, great thought, and maybe the germ of it is something we read in sentencing, which is, you know, the father of federal sentencing reform was Marvin Frankel, who proposed a sentencing commission on which inmates and former inmates would sit. That didn't work out. And one of the other things that, that Marvin Frankel proposed was taking the Bureau of Prisons out of DOJ and placing it elsewhere. And that's, you know, that's a great idea. I have to confess to you that my focus is on more incremental reforms that are, much, that are more likely to actually happen, but that's a great idea, you know. The uh, uh, one facet of this issue these days is compassionate release of old elderly inmates, frail inmates, and it's currently, that currently is, can't be done unless there's a motion by the Bureau of Prisons. And obviously, since they're embedded within the Department of Justice, there are political, maybe it's not obvious to you, I'll tell you. There are political pressures brought to bear on the Bureau of Prisons not to seek compassionate release. So it doesn't happen nearly as often as it should. It's a good idea, Max. I'll go to work on it. Yes, Judge Azraq. Yes, sir. I do, I do. There is, it's actually a very effective program. Um, there's a 500 hour program, it's called RDAP. It's one of those um, acronyms that's used so long, I have no idea what it stands for. Residential Drug Treatment or something. It's a program that once you get close enough to the end of your prison term and you get in, they don't, everybody who needs it doesn't get in, they actually have I mean, it's a prison, so everything is inpatient in a manner of speaking. But they have separate units within the f facility for participants in the RDAP program. It's a 500-hour program. It entitles you by statute to up to a year off your sentence. They tend to get um, about six months off the back end of their sentence. And there's been some pretty, um, uh, not sophisticated, but they've done some tracking of the folks who have successfully completed RDAP, and their, their recidivism rates are good. I mean, it works well. One of the arguments that um, we made in our effort to create these front end, no entry courts, was the re-entry programs appear to be working well. The RDAP program for a, for a too narrow slice of the, popula of the addicted inmate population appear to be working well. Why are we waiting until they're 
either finished with their prison term or in prison for those who maybe we should not send to prison at all if we only give them that treatment up front. But the Bureau of Prisons is farther along now than they were when you were a member of Congress. Yes. You're not. Um, he's not a plan. Um, yes, we have um, a veterans court on the drawing board in the Eastern District of New York. They're an interesting variation on the theme. Um, and the, the reason, I mean, not, not every category that you could think of would warrant an intensive judge-involved supervision program, right? I mean, we send some people to prison these days who shouldn't go to prison at all, and they're neither youthful offenders, nor drug addicts, nor veterans. You know, they're none of those. Um, it doesn't mean we need a special court for them. We just need some sensitivity to the need to incarcerate them. When it comes to veterans, there is a unique array of services available to them that really dwarfs in significance the, in the, not dwarfs, but it's uh, the, the veterans affairs have their own um, counselors, there, there's much more available to veterans. And they pose a different set of, of problems. Obviously, uh, PTSD is one common uh, affliction among the veterans. But most of those courts, I think, are, are arranged around the theme that there's a, a unique array of services available to veterans. So let's have them be together so those services can be more efficiently uh, provided to them. They're, they're a little different in kind from drug treatment and youthful offender courts in that way. It's been a great talk, Chair Friedman. I want to thank you for presenting. Thank you for having me. Let's take this opportunity and also to thank him for his really wonderful 20 years of memory and service on the bench. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.